This is chapter 22, Toxicological Emergencies. So let's talk about poisons. So a poison is, is any substance that gets in your system and can turn into a toxin and damage your organs. Uh, antidotes are things that we give, we can give that reverse these processes. Um, we, as EMTs, carry uh, charcoal, activated charcoal. We learned about that. So that's one form of, of an antidote. There's many others out there that are used in the hospital setting. And an overdose is, is when someone takes too much of something, either on purpose or by mistake. So ingestion, this is the most common way that people get poisoned. And it can either be on purpose, because they want to kill themselves, or accidental or involuntary in the case of, uh, say, food poisoning. The one thing about ingestion is that when you ingest something into your stomach, it takes up to an hour for that substance to break down and be transported through the wall of your stomach and intestines into your bloodstream. So the effect is not immediate, usually, which is good for us because if someone uh, purposely in, in, ingests a, bo a bottle of sleeping pills, they're not immediately going to fall asleep. It's going to take 20, 30, 40 minutes, even an hour before enough of the drug gets into the bloodstream and causes that effect. So if we can get there, they call early enough or someone calls early enough, we get there early enough within that one hour time frame, then we, we might be able to help them with the activated charcoal, or, or and or get them to a hospital where they can be treated and and survive. And again, this is you know almost anything, including bad bad pizza, or any of these chemicals you see in the pictures here. They can all turn into forms of toxins and affect the body. Now inhalation is still fairly popular. This is uh, known as huffing. And this is the person who purposely inhales some kind of chemicals. Uh, paint used to be really popular, spray paint, uh, carburetor cleaner, uh, computer board cleaners. Uh, I'm sure there's you know, gasoline, all the different kinds of things. The problem with inhalation is, is you, you breathe it into your lungs and the, whatever the substance is gets into the bloodstream almost immediately. Uh, creating that that rush, that, that euphoria, that high. So within 30 seconds, they're already affected by whatever they're inhaling. And if they inhale too much of it, they can uh, go unconscious, stop breathing, and then they die from it. So primarily for us, when it comes to people who are huffing, whatever the substance, substance, substance might be, uh, our main priority, of course, is airway, breathing, and circulation. Uh, make sure that they're breathing, uh, bag valve mass ventilations, uh, and of course, the effects on ourselves. So if they're in a small room and they've been huffing paint or whatever the substance might be, you want to get them out of that room into fresh air uh, for your own safety as well as the patient's care. Uh, injection, of course, probably the most common thing people inject is heroin. Uh, but there's other things as well. They, they pop all different kinds of things and inject all different kinds of things uh, in there on purpose. <clears throat> And uh, it's a fairly rapid absorption rate. So if someone injects themselves with, uh, you know, heroin or, or, or gabapentin or uh, fentanyl or whatever they might be, or, or a mixture of whatever they might be doing, uh, it gets into the bloodstream pretty rapidly. And within about a minute or two, they're feeling the effects. So if they did inadvertently give themselves too much, within a couple of minutes, they can go unconscious and stop breathing. And again, we're right back to the ABCs uh, and making sure that they're breathing effectively. And, and uh, if not, then we ventilate them. Now, absorption is another way that people get uh, poisoned. This gentleman right here, he works at a nursery, obviously. He's been sweating all day. He's been, he's been lifting flowers and bags of lime and all that great stuff. And then one breaks open and the powder gets on him. Well, he's been sweating. He's got, he has water in his airway, meaning you know the saliva basically, 
And the problem with lime in particular in this case is lime reacts to water. So when it comes into contact with liquid, it starts to burn, it heats up. So now this gentleman, is, his skin gets red, it starts burning. If you get it up his nose or in his mouth, his mouth starts burning. So now we're talking about this essentially is a hazmat incident. Um, you don't want to walk, walk up to this guy and start, you know, shaking his hand or, or helping him brush off the dust because you don't want to get it on yourself because guess what? You're probably sweating as well. You, you also have saliva and, uh, and uh, water in your airway, essentially. So what you're going to do, in this case anyway, is you're going to have him take off his clothes, in this case probably his shirt, and you're going to hand him a, uh, some kind of brush or clean towel He's going to brush off as much of that dust as possible. And then you're going to take a garden hose and you're going to just flood his body with water to get rid of whatever's left over. As long as you wiped away most of it, he's wiped away most of the powder, uh, it should be okay to, at that point anyway, use the water to flush away whatever's left over. So again, you don't want this guy going in your ambulance uh, full of lime or any other substance. Uh, you want to decon him as best you can on the, prior to transport. Scene size up really revolves around your, you know, your senses. You know, were you, were you smelling something bad in the house? Are you seeing something? Are you hearing something bad? If you're puking, someone's puking their guts out of the bathroom. You smell vomitous down the hallway, there's diarrhea everywhere on the walls, you've got drug paraphernalia, and you, can, you get the idea, bottles of alcohol and such. Um, your primary assessment is basically the same as any other patient, and you're looking for ABCs and LOC and all that. The one thing about poisons is, is if we arrive on scene and they're disoriented or unconscious, or their vital signs are really bad, really low blood pressure, really high heart rate, their breathing is ineffective, that's telling me that this substance, whatever they got in their system, <clears throat> has gotten into their nervous system and it's affecting their brain and brainstem, which means we're already well behind the curve and we cannot really do much for this patient in the field except airway control, uh, protect the airway, suction, nasal pharyngeal airway, BV and ventilations, high flow O2, whatever is appropriate for the patient. Uh, not much else you can do in rapid transport to the hospital. Secondary assessment, of course, if there's family or friends or, or if the patient is you know, awake and able to answer questions, we're going to ask the same kind of sample questions. We're going to ask what they took how much they took, when they took it, of course, and really important here is why they took it. If they said, I want to die today, I have this big EMT test coming up and I, I want to die, well then obviously, you know, then this becomes now a suicide attempt and okay, get the police get involved in all of it. But ultimately your treatment's the same. Um, you can get a set of vital signs, you know, and, and monitor those vital signs every five minutes because as this, as this substance in their, let's say they ingested something like a bottle of pills, as, this, as these pills break down in their system and more and more of it gets into their bloodstream and more and more of it gets to their brainstem and brain, they're going to become more and more symptomatic. You also might want to ask them or maybe the family or friends, did the patient vomit? Now, when a person vomits, uh, usually only a small percentage of the stomach con contents come out. So look in the... Uh, in the vomitus, if it's still around, for pill fragments possibly, they might tell you that it, some of it might have come up anyway, but it's not all of it will have come up. It's still in there. If the patient's awake and alert and cooperative, if they have a GEC reflex, if it's been less than 60 minutes, if they have not ingested uh, any kind of iron tablets or hydrocarbons or acids or alkalis or any isolated alcohol, um, then more than likely you'd be able to assist them with, or give them, sorry, activated charcoal. Uh, the, uh, the dose for this is uh, one gram per kilogram of body weight, up to 100 grams for
for adults, and I believe it's 25 grams for pediatrics. Usually, in most cases, uh, this would be a base hospital order. You'd get a, a, an online medical direction from a nurse or a doctor on the radio, and they would tell you the dose, whatever it is. But that's usually the, the range that you wind up uh, using. It does have some contraindications, like I mentioned already, uh, and, but it has some side effects. And the number one side effect is vomiting. Usually when people uh, drink this stuff down, they usually barf it back up again too, unfortunately. So it can get it can get really messy. So it's a really good idea to have some kind of barf bucket ready and suction ready just in case with this. But they have to be awake, cooperative, alert. Uh, you cannot give it to somebody who's semi-conscious or, or sleepy because if they do vomit uh, in that sleepy state, they can, they can then aspirate that vomitus into their lungs and that's really bad. Different types of poisons. So uh, car carbon monoxide is a product of incomplete combustion. So that could be a car, a motorcycle, uh, a motorized scooter, uh, a fireplace, a gas stove, an uh, apartment fire, a house fire, a brush fire. I mean, it could be anywhere that there's incomplete combustion of some type of hydrocarbon or some kind of product like wood or something that's combustible, you're going to have a, a carbon monoxide release. The thing about carbon monoxide is it's, it's, it's odorless and tasteless. Now, even though the other substances that are burning off, the phosgene gas and the, the carbon and all that stuff, it smells like smoke, the actual carbon monoxide itself is, is not there's no taste or, or, or smell to it. So technically you could have a person who, who is, is running some type of uh, gas heater and then for some reason the vent is, seals up and then the gas heater, the byproduct of the, of the gas burning, has carbon monoxide in it and it's odorless and, and tasteless. Early signs and symptoms, headache, dizziness, Nausea, vomiting, probably the most common ones that I've seen. Uh, late signs, confusion, uh, unresponsiveness, and eventually their skins will turn cherry red, bright cherry red, and it's because the, the carbon monoxide strips the oxygen from the uh, hemoglobin in their bloodstream, and it replaces uh, that with the carbon monoxide. So eventually they get so saturated with carbon monoxide that their skins turn this bright cherry red, unnaturally pink looking skins. Again, it's really late sign. Usually they're uh, unconscious or dead by the time you see that, that phase. Treatment is gonna, number one is get them out of the environment. And obviously you're gonna protect yourself. If you, you shouldn't be entering an environment that's unsafe unless you're properly trained and equipped to do so. But get them out of the environment, give them high flow oxygen, 15 liters per minute or Bag valve, bag valve mass ventilations, um, and if they're unresponsive or they're pregnant, uh, you're going to be transporting them to the hyperbaric chamber, and that is in um, Hillcrest at UCSD Hospital. You can read up on S134 of your county protocols. Uh, cyanide is a pretty rare uh, poison that we encounter, but it's all around us. Uh, cyanide is in certain types of fruits, like apples and, and peach pits and apricot pits and all those things. And there are, have been stories about people who, who will grind up 10 or 20 or 30 uh, uh, apricot pits or peach pits, and they'll drink them down and they get poisoned from the cyanide. More commonly though, and again, very rare, is probably from an industrial site. There are a lot of industrial uh, manufacturers, uh, they use this in their process of chroming plants, photography, uh, 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 businesses. And um, so you're probably gonna encounter these people in, in some kind of you know business environment like that. And federal law says that if, if you're a business that uses cyanide in your process, you have to have the uh, antidote kit on site and people have to be trained to you to be able to use it so you might walk into this call and someone's injecting this person with medications or, or, or putting an inhaler up their nose giving them medications up their nose basically what they're doing is they're going through their cyanide uh, 
protocol. The problem with all this is, is that cyanide gets into your system, however, whether you inhale it or you ingest it or it gets in your skin and you absorb it, it gets in your system and it blocks your mitochondria in your cells from using oxygen. So even though your oxygen saturations on this patient are normal, 98%, 99%, None of that oxygen it can be used, or very little of it can be used for uh, actual function of the cells. And this is why people die from cyanide poisoning. Another problem with all this is, is that when a person absorbs in their body a large quantity of cyanide, they start producing cyanide gas. They actually wind up off-gassing cyanide gas. And so now if you aren't properly pr prepared or covered up, like you see in this picture here, the cyanide gas can get on your skin, you can breathe it in, you can get sick as well. So these, again, these people are like little, little hazmat incidents. And if you encounter someone with cyanide poisoning, you should really consider calling the fire department and then obviously the hazmat uh, team as well. And they're, they're gonna go in, they're gonna treat this person as, you know, as something that's contaminated, which is they kind of are. Uh, number one treatment of this is going to be high flow O2 and get them to a place where they can get the treatment, in this case, the antidote for this. Or if it's on site, you know, let them let the people on site com com complete their protocol. If they're, uh, you know, obviously workers and they know what they're doing with the antidote. Uh, acids and alkalis, uh, these are found everywhere. I mean, bleach and lye and all kinds of stuff. Probably have it in your house, I would imagine. Um, acids are very, very strong, and when they get on your skin, they burn immediately. You're, you're aware almost instantaneously that you're burning, and people have a tendency to run to the nearest source of water, and they you know, wash it away or they dilute it. Uh, the problem with alkalis is, is that they, they don't burn as hot. They're not as painful. So if someone gets an alkali on their skin, it doesn't hurt at first, but it still causes a lot of damage. So they're gonna, they will probably delay their dilution of this with water. So even though acids burn hotter and they're more painful, alkalis are actually more damaging to the tissue. Uh, so this is because they're kind of a delayed re response and the person is less likely to, uh, to dilute it quickly. Now, uh, gasoline, kerosene, uh, different paint products, things like these are all hydrocarbons. People do, do drink these things either on purpose or by mistake. When large enough quantities get in your system, they turn into those toxins I talked about earlier, and they damage your liver, they damage your kidneys. It takes a while for it to happen. Uh, they might not be symptomatic for six, eight, 10 hours, but eventually they're gonna start going into various types of things like altered mental status. The vital signs will get really funky uh, they'll have a really, really high heart rate, really low blood pressure, and they, they're going to become altered in some way, go unconscious, even go into a coma uh, because of this. Just listen, you listen to the story, like what happened, what did you drink, or what did you see that your friend drank anyway. Uh, drugs and alcohol, very common calls that we go on, pretty popular. So... Drug abuse, and these drugs can be over-the-counter drugs, they can be prescription drugs, they can be street drugs. Uh, people abuse all of those. Um, they use them recreationally, they become, uh, they build a tolerance to them, a need for them, and when they don't have them anymore, they go into, unfortunately, with, with, uh, with withdrawals. Uh, even alcohol is considered a drug, and if you are an alcoholic and your body craves this drug and you don't drink the, your beer or your whiskey or wine or whatever your taste is, uh, you'll go through with alcohol withdrawals. And you know people also overdose on, on drugs because especially street drugs, the, uh, the strength of the drug, the dosing is you know very willy-nilly. So you know one batch of heroin might be a lot stronger than the other batch. And, even though this person took their normal dose, whatever that normal dose might be, it might be much more potent and then they would be overdosed on that particular drug. Now, scene size of uh, a lot of cases when we're dealing with the illegal street drugs or recreational use of drugs or alcohol, there's a lot of safety issues with this. I'm sure you probably are 
aware of that. People carry weapons, knives, especially guns sometimes. Uh, they can be very aggressive as well because of their situation or how bad they're feeling, especially if they're withdrawing. Uh, but what you always want to do on all of these calls is don't do not automatically assume that they're just drunk or they're just stoned. Uh, you need to rule out medical causes. Is this person having a stroke? Is this person having a seizure? Is this person has they have they fallen due to their condition? Did they did they drink really heavily and then fall and hit their head? So yes, they're drunk, but they're also now a trauma patient and get a blood sugar. Are they hypoglycemic or are they hyperglycemic? Remember, hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia can both mimic stroke-like symptoms. So get a, a, a blood sugar. And again, um, especially hyperglycemia can mimic uh, someone being intoxicated. Now you encounter someone who's feeling really bad because they took a drug and they don't know what's going on. They're paranoid, they're confused, maybe somewhat aggressive. Uh, remember, people that are in this state, they have a really big personal space. So, you know, get stand 10 feet away. Explain clearly to, the, clearly to them that I'm not a, a police officer. I'm an EMT. Your friends called because they were concerned about you. And you're not feeling good today. It's because maybe you took a drug. I'm here to get you to the hospital so you can feel better. What do you think? Can I come and talk to you? Is it okay if I approach you and talk to you? In most cases, this works. In most cases, they'll calm down, they'll sit down, the muscles will, will, will relax, and you'll be able to slowly approach them. And of course, be careful with this. If they're not really buying the whole <laughs> the whole friend friend thing, uh, then it's time to call the cops if they're not already there, and maybe time to restrain this person. Uh, but we try this first, uh, at least initially anyway, see what happens. We'd rather not restrain unless we absolutely have to, but if you have to, then go right ahead. Now, uh, alcohol syndrome. Uh, people who are chronic alcoholics, they've been drinking for years and years and years and years and years and years. Uh, and, you know, whatever their drug of choice is, meaning the alcohol, and they do mix alcohol with other drugs as well. But they have this condition called the Wernicke Korsakoff syndrome. And these are the medical con conditions that go along with alcoholism. People get, uh, they can get uh, heart attacks from this, they can have strokes from this, they can have early onset dementia, uh, liver disease, hypoglycemia, uh, ulcers. I mean, there's, so what I'm getting at here is, is you may get called out to an alcoholic, but it's not because that he's been drinking, it's because of the secondary effects of his alcoholism that are affecting him physically. Now your book has this, I think it's in your book, and this is just these four stages of alcohol withdrawals. Um, this is very individual to the patient, meaning some patients I've encountered, they go, they go 12 hours without a drink and they're already in stage two. And I've had people go three and four days without a drink and they're in stage one. So there's really not a lot of logic to this. It's really up to the individuals, you know, metabolism and their tolerance. Um, I, I wanted, just wanted to stress that even though there's these stages, one through four, don't think there's this progression of one, two, three, four. These symptoms and these signs can happen at any stage. Usually we encounter these people in stage one. They've stopped drinking for one reason or another and they're starting to feel really bad. They're getting shakes, getting the tremors, they get nausea, they're getting vomiting, they're sweating, they have abdominal pain, and they feel just, they feel like they're just gonna die. And that's when they usually call us. They're stable patients, the vital signs are good, they're awake and alert and talking to us. Um, and if we can get them to the hospital at that, 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 at that stage, uh, then they really don't progress because at the hospital they'll give them medications and intravenous fluids and all kinds of stuff to help, you know, take care of this problem. Uh, get a blood sugar on them, definitely. Uh, a lot of chronic alcoholics are, are just routinely hypoglycemic, so that might pop there. Now the stage two, the, the hallucinations, um, this is, these are usually visual hallucinations, meaning they see really bad things, or they're not seeing pink elephants or, or 
you know, butterflies. They're seeing snakes and rat and uh, and uh, black widows crawling on them. They're very frightening hallucinations, which could cause them to to call at that point as well. But again, they're going to be stable. Uh, you just have to keep them calm. Tell them what they're seeing is is be, is caused by the with the, with their withdrawal syndrome, and that it's, it will go away once the doctors treat them. Our biggest concern, or our second biggest concern, should I say, are the, the actual seizures. Now, again, these seizures can happen in any stage of this, but uh, withdrawal seizures, uh, we talked about this a little bit in the seizure lecture. Uh, these are the seizures that usually wind up being those grand mal status epilepticus, like 10, 15 minute long seizures. So if you are talking to a person who is going through withdrawals of alcohol and you say, have you ever had a seizure before from this condition? And they say, yes, I would probably just get your BVM, set it, set it kind of out, of out of sight on the side there and get your suction and set it over there next to you within arm's reach, just in case they start seizing and you need to support some kind of airway on that. Uh, and then finally with all this is they'll go into the, what's called the delirium tremens. The stage four, and this can be anywhere from happen between 24 hours to 14 days later, and this is the person who's stopped drinking and they they go untreated essentially. They don't go to the hospital. They don't they, they do not get care. So the DTS are truly life threatening. Uh, eventually, this leads to a coma and they have seizures and they finally die uh, from this. So. You know, it's kind of funky because all of these stages kind of flow together and run together. So as an EMT, asking when their last drink was is important. Uh, asking what they're feeling, getting their vital signs, getting a blood sugar on them is important. And being prepared just in case they do seize so you can treat them. Outside of that, that's your only treatment other than transport to the hospital. Now, drugs. Um, prescription drugs are still really popular out there. Uh, kids steal them from their parents, and, and older people steal them from their kids, or whatever it is. Uh, oxycodone, oxycontin is still very popular. It's hard to come by, a little harder to come by now, uh, at least uh, legally, anyway. You could probably buy it on the streets pretty easily. Um, but there's, you know, there's flexorols, and there's sleeping pills, and there's you know, muscle relaxers, and all kinds of stuff. And, these kids, they'll, they'll do, they still do farming parties, though that's getting rarer and rarer now. Uh, they'll take a whole bunch of pills and mix them together into a, a, a bowl, and they just take handfuls of them, and they drink alcohol with them, and they get high, whatever. Uh, sounds like Darwin's theory of evolution to me. But anyway, uh, the big problem we have, too, is, is over-the-counter drugs, uh, especially these two, uh, dextromethorphan, the DMX, and the Benadryl. Though there's tons of others, uh, people use all different kinds of cold tablets and cough syrups and cold medications, and it's amazing what people will will, uh, will ingest to get high. Uh, DMX is uh, is a cough syrup, and it's in most uh, like Nyquil, those kinds of things, like cold remedies. And kids will drink like I think if you drink like a half a bottle of NyQuil. It, it, it gives you like hallucinations and sometimes even like out-of-body experience as well. That's why the kids, you know, use this obviously. The problem is, is it can cause some, some permanent damages and you get enough of it, you can actually die from it. A Benadryl is, uh, you know, it's, it's a antihistamine and, and what it does is it, is it, because it, it blocks uh, the, uh, the cholinergic effect. So that you have, we have this. Uh, it's called acetylcholine, and it's our neurotransmitting substance. So what it does is to to dry up your runny nose, to dry up your itchy, watery eyes. It blocks this transmission of aceti of acetylcholine across this, these membranes or these these nerves. But the problem is, when people overdose on this stuff, it 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 almost completely blocks it, and they get really hyperthermic. And their, uh, their body starts to dry out and they become altered and they start seeing things and it's 
high doses can really screw someone up. Um, and eventually they can die if it's a high enough dose. It's, uh, the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a saying they used to, and I don't remember the whole thing, but it's like, it's, it's like, it's like, like hot, as a, hot, as a, hot as a hot dog or something, and dry as a, you guys get the idea. So basically their, their skins get, get hot and they get dry and they get flush and their mucous membranes dry up and their heart rate just goes crazy really fast and uh, they have an altered mental status. You, you take their temperature and it's, you know, 104, 103, 105, and more than likely in their, uh, their pupils will be really dilated, big, big dilated pupils, and that's a benadryl overdose. Can't do much in the field. They do have an antidote for this uh, in the hospital, but other than support and uh, cool them down with ice packs, oxygen support as needed, get them to the hospital. There's a lot of street drugs out there. Uh, PCP is, has come back. Uh, it's now a, a designer drug, so it's not quite as lethal as it was back in the uh, early 90s, but it's still around and it still affects people. It gives them that disassociative, out-of-body experience and they don't feel pain and, um, and if you mix it with alcohol and other things, it's, it's really a nasty drug. Uh, your biggest problem with these people are going to be just controlling them. You're probably going to have to restrain them if they have a big enough dose in their system. Uh, methamphetamines are, are very, very popular still. It's a cheap way of getting high, essentially. Uh, they're still out there. We'll talk about those in a couple of minutes. Ketamine, uh, you see these at parties and rave parties. Special K, K-holing, I guess, is another. I've heard that one before as well. Um, and uh, this is disassociative, I and mean, it can cause a like a, another kind of out of body experience. You know, you know, you're outside yourself, hallucinations, especially if you're mixing it with alcohol. It's a bad, uh, bad combination. Kids take it usually in pill form, but I've seen powder as well as liquid form as well. They shoot it up, and most commonly in parties, they'll ingest it through uh, in their drink. Um, fentanyl and uh, Getting back to ketamine, it can, it's also used as a date rape drug because it does give you that out of body experience. You don't remember what kind of what happened. Uh, fentanyl, um, there's a type of fentanyl coming across the Mexican border. It's called carfentanil, and it's made illegally. I think it's made in China, as I remember, or it's and then it's cut again in Mexico, and then it's taken across the border and it's sold. As a as a way of cutting heroin, so you can actually mix it with heroin, uh, and sometimes even cocaine. I've heard as well. It's super powerful narcotic. It's like it's like two or three hundred times more potent than the same amount of of heroin. So you can see where if someone took just a tiniest amount of fentanyl, um, they could die from this. But, and if you're, it's mixed, it's mixed with the heroin. So it's, it cuts the heroin essentially, it makes it more potent. Uh, and they take the same amount of heroin they normally take, but now it's cut with fentanyl. This is when we have problems. People, they stop breathing and they, they die. So when it comes to amphetamines, and I'm talking about methamphetamines, cocaine, um, those types of products, um, they cause hyperagitation, increased heart rate, I've seen heart rates 180, 190 beats per minute with this stuff. Um, hyperactivity, dilated pupils. The problem with these people is they become hyperthermic. So their heart races, their metabolism increases dramatically. They're, they're having increased uh, 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 physical uh, demand, I guess, on their body. And their body temperature rises. And it goes, you know, 102, 103, 104. Five. I've seen as high as 106, 107 before these people. And what can happen is, is they, they become disoriented and disassociated. And it's called agitated delirium. And this person is no longer aware of what they're doing. And you can't reason with them. You can't talk them down. Um, they're just going berserk. They're tearing up their house. They're ripping apart the park bench, whatever it is. This person, you, you cannot go, hi, I'm here to help you. 
Um, you need the police there to restrain this person. The problem with all this is, is that in the process of restraining this person, because of this hyperthermia and this increased metabolism in their body, uh, and the fact that they're going to struggle so much to free themselves from your restraining process, uh, the body releases mediators that literally stops their heart. And I'm sure you've heard the stories where you, they get this bizarre acting guy, the cops arrest him, they put him you know, in restraints, and they throw him in the back of the squad car, and they drive him to the police headquarters. And when they get there, uh, the guy's dead. He died in the back of the squad car. And so this is why cops, when they encounter these people now, they, they don't just haul them off to the jail anymore. They call EMS because it's a big high liability for them. So our number one priority here is airway control and, uh, and cooling them down, getting ice packs on them and cooling them down. Otherwise, they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna seize and then go into cardiac arrest. And I know, you know, I know marijuana is, is a legal drug now in the state of California anyway. Uh, and people consider it a benign, you know, a party, benign kind of thing, kind of like, like almost like recreational alcohol consumption. The problem with the marijuana that we have nowadays is it's been hybridized so much that when they do extract, you know, the THC, it's pure THC. So if someone... You know, if someone decides they want to ingest a candy with THC or baked products like brownies, or they make a tea out of it, or they they use the oil. It's it's what that's like 100% pure THC. So you get somebody who um, I go on these calls all the time. You get some guy who who's not doesn't isn't aware of you know the potency of this drug, and they'll buy they go to the typical to the can the cannabis store and they'll buy a like a 50 milligram brownie. And it says right on the packaging, it says, you know, cut it up into 10 pieces or eight pieces and have one piece at a time. And, they, and they, they'll take a piece, like one piece, a corner of it, and they'll ingest it with some alcohol, maybe, who knows. And nothing happens. Like 20 minutes later, and they're going, this is bullshit, right? So then they just eat the whole thing. So now they got 50 milligrams of THC in their bloodstream, and they get, within an hour, they're tachycardic. I've seen heart rates up to 180, 190, 200. They're hyperactive, they're super paranoid, they're scared, they think they're going to die, uh, they're dripping with sweat, they're pale, cool, diaphoretic, and this is just uh, just an overdose of THC, essentially. It's seen mostly with edibles and things that are ingested. Uh, if, um, if someone like, rolls, a, rolls a doobie and smokes it, even though the marijuana is highly potent and you know now, it, it gets you into your bloodstream more quickly and, and more of a steady rate, so to speak, versus eating a whole like 10 gummy bears at once and then it'll hit it all getting into your bloodstream at the same time. Bam, it hits you all at the same time. So you'll go on these calls. Um, not much you can do for them except, you know, keep them calm and take them to the hospital. It will wear off. It just, it's got to work, work its way out. Ecstasy is still really popular. I do work a lot of rave parties, and uh, people still use this in various forms, liquid or pill uh, forms. Um, the big concern here is you get these young people, they take ecstasy to get all sexy and, you know, hyperactive, and they drink alcohol, and between the activity and the alcohol, it dehydrates them, and it makes them hyperthermic. So again, you got that same problem with hyperthermia, and eventually, if you mix alcohol and, and this and this ecstasy together with the hyperthermia, you get no breathing, and they stop breathing, and you wind up having to bag valve mass ventilations on them. And um, again, like, a lot of rave parties, a lot of uh, these uh, dance parties, you see this at. Uh, heroin is uh, is very very popular. It's fact, it's now crossed over into pretty much all socioeconomic levels in our country. So it's not just the, the lower class of people, if you want to use that term. Uh, rich people are using it. Middle class people are using it. Uh, it's still fairly inexpensive, apparently, and it's easy to acquire, unlike oxycodone, which is hard to acquire uh, now. So people are getting away from the you know what they were addicted to, and now they're addicted to heroin. 
problem with heroin is, is you know, it isn't injected usually or popped into their skin, though they can do it other ways as well. Uh, but usually injected is the most popular. And it, it hits the body, it hits the brain stem really, really, or the brain really, really quickly. And depending on the dose, you know, like again, we're back to that same dosing thing. This, this, this person has been getting a, a heroin from a, from a particular source and they've worked out the dosing, the amount of volume of drug that they need to liquefy and inject and it's been working for them and then suddenly they, they change, you know, they, they, they go from one to like maybe China White, which is almost a pure form of heroin. Uh, now they're taking the same quantity of liquid but it's 10 times more powerful. And it could be even cut with fentanyl and on top of that. So now these people are dying because they're overdosing on, on, this, on this opioid or narcotic. Now, you already know, you learned about Narcan or naloxone hydrochloride. You know that you can administer on standing order if their breathing's less than 12 breaths per minute and you suspect this might be some kind of narcotic overdose. It doesn't have to be heroin. It could be any of the narcotics out there. You know, even the over-the-counter, you know, in the um, prescription stuff as well. And uh, you administer it, and it usually reverses the process. But before you give the Narcan, remember ABCs. If they're not breathing effectively, if they're not breathing, uh, bag valve mass ventilations, put a nasal pharyngeal airway in, get them breathing again artificially. And then when you stabilize their airway, then you take your Narcan and you administer the Narcan. Remember, it's always, it's always the BLS before you go on to the more advanced care. Lastly on this, um, if, we, if we haven't already had your protocol quiz yet, uh, you're going to be covered, at least in the case of this topic anyway, S134 and S142. Uh, know how to treat a, an ingested poison patient. Uh, know how to treat skin exposures, meaning dry chemicals versus wet chemicals. So dry chemicals, you brush off and then flush, and the wet chemicals you just flush with water. Uh, know how to treat a patient who's been exposed to like carbon monoxide, what you do for a conscious patient versus an unconscious patient, where do you take them. Uh, know how to treat a patient who has been exposed to radioactive contamination. And uh, someone who's hyperthermia, uh, thermic from stimulation or stimulants, this would be the uh, excited delirium patient. Know how to treat that and know how to treat your opioid overdoses with your Narcan. And we're done.